Welcome, everybody. Um, good afternoon, and thank you for being here for the second installment of our Dean's Distinguished Speaker Series. Um, you're in for a treat today. For those of you who have not met me, I'm not the treat, for sure. I'm Rich Corsi. I'm the Dean of the, of the College of Engineering. And I have the distinct honor of introducing today's distinguished speaker, Dr. Kim Budell. Uh, she'll be presenting her lecture entitled Science and Technology on a Mission. Dr. Budell is the 13th director of Lawrence Livermore National Laboratory. She was appointed in 2021 and is the first woman to serve in the role in the lab's 69 year history. Dr. Budell came to the lab in 1987 as a graduate student in laser programs and became a postdoc in the weapons program in 1994. Over her career, she has held roles across Lawrence Livermore National Lab programs, including weapons and complex integration in which she served as principal associate director as well as global security, the National Ignition Facility, and physical and life sciences. She's also served as vice president for national laboratories in the University of California Office of the President, in which she was responsible for the governance and oversight of Lawrence Livermore, Lawrence Berkeley, and Los Alamos National Laboratories, as well as development of strategic partnerships between the 10 UC campuses and those laboratories. Dr. Budell is also a UC Davis alumna. All right having obtained a master's degree and PhD from our College of Engineering. She received the college's Distinguished Engineering Alumni Medal in 2019 in honor of her, of her extraordinary achievements. And we're grateful to have her with us today back on the UC Davis campus. And with that, please join me in welcoming Dr. Kim Budell. He saved the best part for last. So. And I'll apologize in advance. I had knee surgery about a week ago. So if I look like I'm hobbling around, I'm not that old. It's just that I'm a little stiff. So <clears throat> thank you, uh, Dean Corsi, and thank you all for coming today. I'm excited to tell you a little bit about my laboratory. Uh, we've had a very, very exciting year. Some of you may have seen us in the news for a minor scientific breakthrough. I'll get to that in a minute. Um, I thought I would start, though, by giving you a little bit of context. What are national labs? What does my national lab do? <clears throat> Show you a couple of examples of the kind of work we do, and then take a deeper dive into our inertial confinement fusion program, since I think many of you are probably here because of that. So we're one of 17 DOE national labs, and many people don't appreciate the breadth and scale um, across the country. And the labs do different things. There are multi-programmatic science labs, single program labs, and then national security labs, multi-program national security labs. So my lab, Los Alamos and Sandia, all support the safety, security, and reliability of the nation's nuclear deterrent, work across a really broad range of national security missions. And the way we do that is we take leading edge science and technology and bring them to bear on these important challenges in security. So our lab's a little unique in this context. Uh, we're a very compact laboratory, so we're about one square mile. We have a little over 8,000 employees. So over the last five or six years, we've hired about 3,000 people. So for anyone who's graduating, remember that. We are hiring, so I don't want to miss that opportunity. Um, we have a huge range of disciplines rec represented on our site. So many engineers, chemists, physicists, computer scientists, biologists, <clears throat> social scientists, uh, anything and everything you can imagine. And because of our small site, it's really easy to create new partnerships, new projects, uh, new ways of working together. If you listen to my bio, you might say, she can't hold a job. She's just like roaming the land. That could be, still be true. But <clears throat> what it was is I spent 35 years uh, following the interesting problems around the laboratory and really getting to do a lot of different things. So it's an awesome place to work. We finished last year with just under $3 billion in budget. So I can't quite claim that yet, but we're getting close. We also run a second site uh, that's about 30 minutes east of the lab where we do explosives testing and increasingly uh, energy research. So our core mission is national security. So we think about what's going on in the world and try to develop effective strategies to deal with and mitigate those threats. And it's anything and everything you can imagine in national security space. So that could be uh, things like you're seeing in Ukraine with the Russian invasion. We've been uh, doing direct support to that effort, uh, understanding what some of our adversaries or um, 
competitors are doing around the world and thinking about capabilities across the nuclear domain, but the conventional domain, directed energy space, cyber, bio, all of the traditional threat spaces and beyond. And so if you think about our mission at a high level, it really encompasses everything in these four panels. So our core mission, as I mentioned, is nuclear deterrence. We do threat preparedness and response, and that's all threat, chem, bio, rad, nuke, explosive. Um, huge activities uh, in some of those areas. Climate and energy security. So the very first global circulation models were created and run at Livermore in the 1950s, built on the modeling and simulation tools we built in our nuclear weapons program. Nuclear weapons are a big multi-physics complicated problem, coupled system, the climate similarly. Uh, so we were able to take those tools and, and put them to work there. And we have some of the most advanced climate capabil modeling capabilities in the world. Increasingly focus on energy security. That includes civilian infrastructure. So we have a big program trying to understand how to secure infrastructure like the grid that was built long before cybersecurity was a thing. Uh, and there are many issues there. And then multi-domain deterrence really is everything else. So space, cyber, uh, conventional, et cetera. So how do we do this work? There's a lot, it's very complicated. Well, we use experimental science and advanced modeling and simulation to develop a detailed understanding of these complex challenges and problems and to propose solutions. So at a high level, you know, the, the core mission, our core nuclear security missions set the topography of the lab. It tells us what disciplines we need to be good at. It tells us what big facilities and capabilities we need to have on our site. And then we can use those tools, capabilities, people, ideas to work on other mission spaces. So if you think about the main pillars of Livermore's capability, these are the three things that I would cite. The first one is computing. So we were founded in 1952. The very first thing the lab bought in 1952 was a supercomputer of the day. So that's been part of our DNA since our founding. Today we're home to the Sierra supercomputer. That's a 125 petaflop machine. We typically have somewhere between five and eight of the machines on the top 100 lists. Here it says we have, uh, I think, nine on the top 500 lists currently. This year we're taking delivery of El Capitan. That will be the, an exascale computer, the first exascale computer for national security. And that'll be somewhere just north of two exaflops in capability. So just an incredible leap. <clears throat> and in general, we purchase a second system to do open science and research that's one order of magnitude smaller. So our little open science computer will be a 100 petaflop machine when this is done. So that's coming. On the right, <clears throat> over the last decade, we've made uh, major investments and grown an enormous program in advanced uh, manufacturing and materials, particularly centered on additive manufacturing across all material types. So we work on everything from polymers and ceramics uh, to metals uh, and even biomaterials. And we built up a lot of really interesting capabilities <clears throat> in our, uh, we have an additive advanced manufacturing lab that sits outside the fence at our site that allows us to do partnerships with industry, either to commercialize technologies to go out or to help them mature their technologies by getting access to our researchers. Uh, also work with academic partners and we've invented a number of technologies in this arena, which we use for our core business, but have really broad application. But the one that everyone's heard about is our National Ignition Facility. So the NIF is the world's largest, most energetic laser. To give you a sense of scale, <clears throat> the facility that the NIF sits in is three football fields in extent and 10 stories tall. So that laser can deliver just over two megajoules of laser energy in about a nanosecond, about a billionth of a second. So it's an incredibly uh, high energy density source uh, that we use to do a lot of things. Uh, we use it to study the most extreme states of matter in the universe, like the conditions at the center of the giant planets, or what the conditions are in exploding supernovae. And we also use it to study <clears throat> fusion, fusion processes. Uh, and of course, the breakthrough we had last December was for the first time <clears throat> in a laboratory, we achieved fusion ignition. 
So more energy out in fusion reactions than we put in, in laser energy, a little over three megajoules fusion to two megajoules of laser energy, uh, which is an extraordinary scientific accomplishment, 60 years in the making. Of course, it takes 300 megajoules off the grid to run the laser, so it's not, no, it's not quite, it's not a power plant, it wasn't built to be a power plant. Um, but really an extraordinary scientific facility. And with this laser and its predecessor lasers, we've created a whole new field of science called high energy density science, where you can you know, put materials into these incredible conditions and start to understand their unique properties. Um, a key feature uh, in this arena and in the additive manufacturing, again, is bringing together modeling and simulation and increasingly data science, AI, machine learning to build really sophisticated models. Uh, building advanced diagnostics to get you know, really rich data sets and understand all aspects of the physics and chemistry, material science engineering that's going on there. And similarly in the manufacturing, trying to build in design optimization, uh, on machine part inspection and acceptance, uh, you know, really trying to bring all these capabilities together. So it's a pretty cool place. And all my slides have pictures that are like 70,000 times more high resolution than I needed. So it may be a little slow. <clears throat> We're very high tech, but we haven't figured out how to do that. Uh, if you look, take a step back from those three pillars, uh, this is what we call our core competency set. So these are the areas where we have to be very good. We have significant staff in these areas and uh, do leadership science in them. Um, for example, in nuclear, chemical, and isotopic s and we have a very large cosmochemistry group uh, that's done things like do analysis of samples from uh, space missions. Uh, they also do things like heavy element research, and they've put six elements on the periodic table, including one called Livermorium. And if you come to Livermore at 116 Livermore Avenue, that's the number on the table for uh, Livermorium, there's Livermorium Plaza. So we're super excited about that. Uh, of course, with these big lasers, we're also very good at optics and optical s and We've had a large effort in space science across our history. Uh, the laser guide star was invented at Livermore. So it's a technique to correct for the aberrations from the atmosphere for ground-based telescopes. So it really has made ground-based telescopes much more powerful. But we can also build really cool monolithic optics packages, including now by additive manufacturing, that can fly on small satellites and give you really amazing imaging capabilities for a small package. Uh, I already mentioned earth and atmospheric science and uh, most people don't think about us as a biology lab. We've been doing biology since the 1950s as well. In the early years, it was really trying to understand the effects of radiation on humans, uh, but it's grown over many years to include development of medical technologies like the first artificial retina. Uh, we were part of the team that launched the Human Genome Project uh, uh, rapid techniques for uh, polymerase chain reaction, PCR, and now today the application of high-performance computing. So really exciting. So why do we do all this stuff? So you're a national security lab, why do you have all this open science? Well, in order to have good science, great science, leading-edge science, the best tools, the best capabilities, the best people, you have to participate in the open science community. So this is really important. Our people have to write papers, they have to go to conferences, they have to engage with the broader community. It's also true that while I have, you know, half roughly of our employees are scientists, engineers of one sort or another, so I have 4,000. Uh, there are many, many more smart people and ideas and tools and technologies outside of my lab than inside. So partnerships and engagement with the broader community, academia, researchers at other labs, the international science community is incredibly important. And we work in this community to develop ideas and people and tools and capabilities, and then we bring them to bear in the national security space so that we can always make sure that that uh, important mission has the right kind of uh, capabilities. Today, we have uh, created a set of what I'm calling focus areas. So I asked my team, what are the biggest, most important challenges facing the nation and the world today for which we have something unique to offer? And then the second question is, what is the biggest impact you could imagine having if we weren't kidding? Like, we're really gonna do this, all the capabilities of the lab, we're gonna invest. And these are the four mission focus areas, uh, one in our core business and one in this area of integrated deterrence, which the Department of Defense is trying to understand 
how to achieve advantage in a world where scale doesn't really help you. The US has a very mighty conventional force, um, but you can't counter every threat just by size. But I'm gonna talk a little bit about the two in the middle. So in bioresilience, the question there is, how do you make the nation resilient to emergent and pandemic disease? Uh, we were very lucky in this last pandemic that decades of research on things like mRNA vaccines was available to have a rapid response. We may not be so lucky next time. So how do we put the tools in place to ensure we can do that quickly? And then in climate, as I said, we do these incredibly high resolution climate simulations we're beginning to bridge the scale gap between weather and climate. We know things are happening. How do communities prepare? Things are going to change, and how do you adapt to those changes and mitigate the worst impacts? So let's get that, talked about that. So let's talk about bio for a minute. About a decade ago, we had a great idea. We have these enormous computers. We have a group of computational biologists who have been building increasingly sophisticated models, understanding how models understanding how molecules bind to human cells and thinking you know if we could use computing to figure out which drug targets are the most effective we could make this timeline which is typically a decade and at the end of that decade 90 percent of drugs fail much shorter and much more effective so that 90 percent of drugs perhaps succeed so we began working to build partnerships and understand how to uh, do this. <clears throat> and in the meantime, in the broader community, <clears throat> you know, there's this huge convergence of capabilities that make this plausible. One is, of course, the scale of computing that's available, but the tools for gene editing or gene sequencing, uh, the ability to understand in detail human tissues and models, um, lab automation and new ways to do screening, high, high throughput screening and testing, uh, application of things like AI and machine learning to ingest these enormous data sets really says there's an inflection point here where you could do something interesting. So we set out and built this first partnership, Atom, which was uh, spurred by GlaxoSmithKline, so one of the big pharma companies. And it was built to be an open partnership so other companies could join. It was the National Cancer Institute initially DOE, Lawrence Livermore, UCSF, and Glaxo. And the idea was to build a toolkit, a computational toolkit that would allow you to do rapid screening of candidate molecules. Really works well, was really very interesting, uh, very hard to get purchase in the government for a bigger program around this, because who's worried about rapid response to pandemics? We hadn't had one in a very long time. Fast forward, the response to COVID was a huge wake up call in the government. We did a lot of work, as did all the national laboratories, to respond. <clears throat> For example, we did projects to redesign antibodies. They would become ineffective as a new variant of COVID would emerge. So over the course of a couple of weeks, we could design new candidate antibodies that would successfully bind to the new variants. So we really got to show live fire how this could work. Uh, today, this program that is up there called GUIDE <clears throat> is uh, now a $30 million effort to really take these tools and develop a framework for rapid response to emergent disease. So I think this is a huge opportunity uh, for the whole community. Uh, I tell my kids I plan to live to be 150 because the pace of progress in the biosciences, nexus between computing and engineering and biology is so extraordinary uh, that it's plausible. Not just live, have a good quality of life. So hopefully when the next pandemic hits, we will be prepared and ready uh, to respond in real time. In the climate arena, you know, we're seeing the effects of a changing climate all over the place. So while we have great expertise in understanding anthropogenic climate change, why the climate is changing, for me the pressing problem is what are we gonna do about it? Because we're seeing these impacts today. So in California is a living lab for everything that's going haywire in the climate today. So if we take our models, and this is just one example, showing an atmospheric river, who knew that was a thing, um, making landfall in California, you know, the resolution in this model is good enough that you can see local effects. So we're getting to the point where we can run models at several kilometers resolution 
that allows you to understand in great detail what communities need to be prepared for. So we did a big effort uh, funded by our Livermore Lab Foundation for the state, produced this report, Getting to Neutral, which assessed the feasibility of achieving California's climate neutrality goals. That's now been turned into a DOE effort to do a national report uh, to look at how we can take the technologies we know about for carbon capture and sequestration or sequestering carbon in deep-rooted plants, land management, uh, conversion of carbon into other chemicals that are useful, uh, and how we could take that to a national footprint. On the good news front, the answer is it is feasible. We have many of these tools and technologies in hand today, and with will and resources, many of these changes can be affected. And so we're working, for example, in Kern County, which is an oil and gas community, to help them understand how that infrastructure could be used to sequester carbon underground and, and achieve a, you know, an economic transition in addition to the energy transition. So let's talk fusion for a minute. So I already gave you the basic specs on the NIF. This is a good picture. It doesn't have, the fire hydrant doesn't really give you the sense of scale. I'll just say that. There's no people in this picture. Um, when we started building this laser, the prior laser was about a 40 kilojoule laser. So that's a big scale up from 40 kilojoules to 2 million joules. Um, seven of the key technologies that would be required to make this laser work did not exist. So we convert the light from infrared to ultraviolet at the very end because that's more effective for the experiments we do. In order to grow the crystals at the scale they needed to be, which is this big, would have taken decades using old technologies. So we brought a new scientist in who invented a new technique for growing those crystals rapidly and we were able to grow all the crystals for the facility in a year. We needed giant uh, plasma switches that would allow you to hold the laser in the amplifiers while it built up all that energy and then switch it out very quickly. Those, again, were invented on the fly. So in addition to being an incredible scientific, I mean, changing the world scientific facility, it is an engineering marvel, uh, just a true testament to what is possible and sort of a view right directly into the ego of Livermore, I would say. <laughs> Uh, this is the kind of thing we do, first of a kind, one of a kind, at scale. Um, people said it was impossible. For our 70th anniversary, our tagline was making the impossible possible for 70 years. So it's in keeping. And this facility was built to do national security. So when the nation decided to stop nuclear testing, we lost access to the conditions around fusion. Modern thermonuclear weapons operate based on fusion and so understanding that science in detail uh, was something we wanted to move to the laboratory. So the success of this facility is part of our strategy to never have to return to nuclear testing again. And creating these extreme conditions allows us to do many, many other things. And the scientific opportunities have been extraordinary. But at its core, it's called the National Ignition Facility. It was built to create conditions that would allow us to achieve fusion ignition in the laboratory. And the basic process is illustrated here. Two hydrogen isotopes, tritium and deuterium, come together and they form a helium atom and they release a neutron. And that neutron carries away energy. So it's a very energetic process, the process that fuels the sun. Of course, the sun is massive and it has gravity and that's what it uses to push the deuterium and tritium together. We don't do it quite the same way. So we use a little tiny pellet that's about a millimeter or two millimeters in diameter. The current design uses pellets made of diamond that are filled with deuterium and tritium. And we use x-rays to squeeze that pellet. And the trick is, can you make squeeze it together fast enough to a high enough density, uniformly enough, and hold it together long enough so that the fusion reactions take over? And honestly, we knew what the basic physics was and what the basic barriers were to making that work for the better part of 60 years. Um, it turns out it's really hard. And again, I think the engineers get to be the heroes in this story. So where were we 60 years ago? 60 years ago, a researcher at our lab, John Knuckles, um, had an idea for doing fusion ignition in the laboratory. 
He said, what if we used lasers, which had just been invented? So think, try to imagine a time when there wasn't a laser on every street corner in your pocket and your phone at the grocery store. What if we could make lasers bigger and we could use them to make x-rays and those x-rays could heat a little capsule and blow off the outer surface and compress it and then we could get fusion ignition in the laboratory. John said, what if we had a thousand joule laser? That's really big. That should work. So we're at two million and counting. This program was born and a succession of larger and larger lasers was built. And I mentioned NOVA, that's where I did my early career research. Uh, the National Ignition Facility was finally uh, uh, begun in the late 1990s. I did the very last shot on NOVA in 1999, June of 1999, and I know that very precisely because my son was born about a week later. Uh, NIF came online in 2009. So we've been operating for a little more than a decade. And the first part of that decade uh, was a struggle. So it's not hard to make a few fusions. It's very hard to achieve those conditions I described, where that hot plasma stays together and allows the fusion reactions to cook and continue. We put a lot of uh, diagnostic capabilities on this facility. So this picture here shows the neutron emission from the core of a really good target, <laughs> very symmetric and round. This gives you a sense of scale of the actual target there. I talked to you about how big the facility is, football fields and 10 stories. The actual target where we focus all that energy is a little gold can that's about a centimeter long. And within that can, so the laser beams hit the gold can, within that can is this little tiny pellet. Um, just extraordinary. And so for a very, very brief moment in time, we create literally the most extreme conditions in the universe. This will show you up close what the process looks like. X-rays come into the can. That target is cooled to cryogenic temperatures. So you get to the triple point of uh, hydrogen. There's an ice layer of DT and then DT gas in the center. The lasers hit the gold can and create x-rays. The x-rays bathe the outer surface of the capsule. The outer surface blows off, so the rocket effect says the inner surface moves in. And that capsule begins to drive fusion reactions. And if there are no imperfections in the target, so if there are little ripples or bumps in the target or uh, imperfections in the way the diamond is made, that cold material gets into the hot fusion fuel and turns the fusion reactions off. So in a perfect world, we get to those conditions there on the end. So this is a brief movie that's gonna show you how a shot actually proceeds. So this is our control room. The head of this uh, organization was an astronaut. So this is modeled on the NASA control room. The whole laser is computer controlled. So this group of people can manage the entire operation of the facility by themselves in this room. They go down to the, uh, this room, the master oscillator room. This is where the only actual laser in the facility exists. A very low energy, small pulse is generated and begins to be amplified. So that pulse gets produced. It gets split two ways and then it gets split 48 ways, and 96, and these are large amplifier systems. So they're big pieces of glass that are doped with neodymium. They get pumped with flash lamps, which are like flash bulbs, uh, and the laser pulse passes back and forth and extracts that energy, getting more and more energetic. When it gets to peak energy, all that uh, energy is switched out with those plasma switches I talked to you about and all the beams go into the target area. So 96 beams come in through the bottom, 96 beams come into the top of the chamber. That's the target chamber. If you watch the movie Star Trek Into Darkness, 2009-10 vintage, the target chamber played the warp core of the Starship Enterprise in that movie. Here you can see the lasers hitting the wall, heating up the capsule, and blowing off the surface and then igniting. So what was really 
amazing was the journey to figure out why it took so long to get to those conditions. So this is an, some examples of the types of diagnostics we have on a shot. That yield and fuel uniformity is a neutron sky map for what's happening in the chamber. Uh, we have uh, cameras that can take very fast pictures of how shocks are moving through materials so we can understand how that compression wave is passing through the target. We can understand how the fusion burn is proceeding. So even when it doesn't ignite, we can get a signal from those neutrons and, and understand the conditions. We can measure the shape of the fuel. So what does that hotspot really look like? Is it uniform? And we can look at the temperature in that little x-ray can so that we can try to understand how to make things better. And it turns out that symmetry, making that hotspot round, mix, which is those little perturbations I described, disrupting the implosion, and the way the laser energy gets delivered so that it's very symmetric. Otherwise, it pushes the fuel in one direction were the three keys to controlling this process. So we started doing experiments uh, in the National Ignition Campaign around 2009. And I can't tell if this is, I didn't want this to be animated, but there we go. The yields we got were very low. So watch this axis is gonna change a lot over the arc of this. We started with plastic capsules. It turns out they were very unstable. So mix was a terrible problem, much worse than we had anticipated. And because we'd never worked at this scale of laser energy, we didn't really have models that were accurate enough to predict that. Around 2013, we made some switches in the way we shaped the laser pulse that really gave us a big jump. So we went from a few kilojoules to 25 kilojoules to about 100 kilojoules. And then we came out here into the latter part of the decade we switched from plastic to diamond, which made it easier to get the laser energy in the capsule because of the pulse shape we could use. And we had the first shot heard around the world. So that first big spike there was August of 2021. Uh, we went into that experiment thinking we would get a yield of about 400 kilojoules of fusion, which would have been amazing. We had been at about 175. Uh, we got 1.35 megajoules. And the beauty of these experiments is it's not ambiguous. If you make that many neutrons, there's no question about it, right? Everything gets very hot uh, and many things are activated. And so that was a huge indicator to us that we were very close and that we would likely be able to achieve ignition. Uh, it took us another year's worth of work. And on December 5th last year, we had the shot that achieved uh, just over three megajoules, which is extraordinary. But Sorry, that went the wrong way. You know, we learned a lot along the way. We had to, as I said, improve stability. We had to change LPI's laser plasma interactions. We had to uh, change the way the laser was interacting with the target. We had to make the targets more symmetric. We had to improve the production of those targets in this exquisite little work of art, uh, which is the most precise engineered object man has ever made, uh, still needed help. So where do we go with this? So this is the core building block for inertial fusion energy. We have many orders of magnitude and gain and many physics challenges to surmount to get there, uh, but we're excited in building an initiative around uh, the prospect for inertial fusion energy. Since private companies are eager, the Department of Energy is eager, uh, we have the physics backbone. Uh, we're trying to build an ecosystem where they can work with us to try to advance the technology. We have schemes for fusion power plants. You know, our core job is stockpile stewardship, uh, but this is an opportunity that's too good for the world uh, to miss. And we have some existence proofs that technologies can come together in a way that will allow us to do this. Um, many of you have heard of extreme ultraviolet lithography. That's what's making those little tiny uh, features and the semiconductors in your phones, your iPhone. That was actually invented by the national labs. Livermore was a big part of that. And it brings together many of these technologies, high rep rate lasers, uh, complex interactions with materials, um, high reliability systems that can run for a long period of time. So we're super excited and continuing this work. Hopefully you're gonna hear a lot more about that. So I'm gonna leave you with one last thought. Well, there's ignition, it's pretty cool. If your lab gets ignition, you get to do all sorts of cool things. Like I got to be on 60 Minutes, I got to go to Davos to the World Economic Forum. It was kind of weird.
going to leave you with this last thought. I mentioned the importance of engaging with the outside world. On the eastern side of our campus, we have this open campus area. Uh, this is the historic Hertz Hall where I did my PhD work. Um, and it's now a University of California asset, has been renovated in this beautiful collaboration space. So we're eager to have partnerships and uh, have folks coming to Livermore to meet with us and work with our researchers. Uh, and we're building an increasingly large array of capabilities out here. We have office space, we have this advanced manufacturing lab, computing, we have plans for a bio building uh, and for a prototyping facility to do uh, technology scale up. So it's an incredibly exciting time at the lab. And I hope many of you will partner with us, work for us, uh, or send your students to us. And I'll leave it at that and take any questions you might have. Thank you, Ken. That's great. Apologize. So we have time for a couple of questions. And Paul will run to you with the microphone. Questions? Be questions. <laughs> so I know that um, the sort of getting getting those capsules uniform uh, and and being able to reliably produce them has been a, a really big issue and one of the the main reasons for the recent advancements we saw in 2021 and 2022. Um, what can we expect in the future in terms of making those capsules and making them better? And is that still sort of a, a major barrier to improving the fusion experiments at NIF? Yes, uh, it's definitely a major barrier and a major challenge for us. So we make these, these diamond capsules are coated onto mandrels. And it's still the case that we make a batch of, big batch of targets and someone laboriously looks through all the targets, figures out which the best capsules, which ones are the best capsules and then you know, we see if they survive assembly and then we uh, try to do experiments with them. But it's just, it's slowing the pace of progress dramatically that we don't have a more reliable process and that we're still getting significant uh, inclusions and, and um, imperfections in the capsules. One goal as we increase the yield is to see if we can go back to something like plastic, which is easier to make and more uniform um, and it would be a more reliable production process um, but it's very, we learned the hard way that the plastic capsules are not robust enough uh, with the current energy levels that we have. So still a lot of challenges. I'm meeting with the Target Fab team later this week or next week to talk about how we're going to get to a better state. Um, but we really need um, both better diagnostics, better manufacturing processes, more reliable manufacturing processes. Uh, and more repeatable target outcomes. So. Um, th that was awesome, really appreciate it. If you were gonna, you know, definitely take into account that it's gonna take a long time to get to a functioning, you know, fusion energy sort of solution in a societal way. Um, but if you were gonna draw on a whiteboard, like the the dream ideal collaboration who would be the partners with you guys to make this you know make this happen at scale so there are sort of uh, a few components to the collaboration ecosystem we're trying to create we need um, industry partners because ultimately a power plant is going to be built by an, an industry partner many of the technologies that you would need for an ife plant exist, they need to be scaled up or advanced. Um, but again, that's work that could be done in the private sector to, to scale that up. Uh, we need a very significant increase in the level of public funding in this area because the national labs have very unique capabilities in material science and the fusion work that we're doing in the target design and the codes that we have. Uh, and we need dedicated resources to think about the energy applications on that front. Uh, we need academic partners uh, both from a workforce pipeline standpoint, but also for new ideas and for working on some of these big challenges that we have, because there are some significant, significant issues there. So, you know, the, this public-private partnership is important. The public investment side of it is critical, because it, you know, 
patient public investment over 60 years is what got us to this point. And I don't know how long it will take for us to get to a power plant. I will say there's more than $4 billion has gone in venture capital money has gone into fusion startups in the last couple of years. Well, I think it's not the case that the only thing that stood between us and fusion energy was VC money. So I think that's a fair statement. But in some sense, time is money. So if I want all the brightest minds in the country or in the world focused on advancing the science and technology of fusion, I need resources to draw them to it. Right? We've shown as a country we can do amazing things when we bring people together around these grand challenges. So maybe it could be two decades. Wouldn't that be amazing? Right? And fusion's inherently safe. Right? If I turn the laser off, the fusion stops. <laughs> There's no problem. So it just, it's a game changer if we can make it work. So. One more question. So, so you, you've shown us such a broad range of mind-blowing, cutting-edge things. It's really very exciting work. I think what I want to touch upon is probably going to have a similar answer of public partner, public um, private partnerships and large cooperation. But since climate is one of the themes of our college, and it's clearly one of your themes, and like you said, California is a living laboratory, I was hoping to get a little of your vision for that same question, like who needs to come to the table? How can we actually make translational changes that will have impact on this state that's, you know, we all love and want to keep enjoying this kind of beautiful climate that we have? Question, and it goes a little beyond public-private partnerships. There's a huge gap uh, for communities in understanding the types of technologies we're talking about and trusting the types of things we're trying to take to scale. So for me, a big element of whatever we want to do in the climate space has to be public education and outreach. Really working with communities to help them understand the challenges that they're facing and what these technologies can and cannot do, uh, directly addressing safety concerns and considerations, and understanding the economic impact that this transition is going to have on often fragile communities. So I mentioned Bakersfield. We can't take the oil and gas industry out of Bakersfield because it would be an economic catastrophe. So how do we build a plan that allows us to transition away from that in a way that sustains the community and builds a, more, uh, a, builds a better future for them? So public education and outreach and really building trust uh, is a key component. I think it's another one where academic institutions have a huge role to play, both in this education function, uh, but in also being long-term partners in those communities. You, know, you have a, a local constituency, you know the players in the local government, you know the civic leaders in the area, um, you know, you, you're a trusted source of research uh, and workforce pipeline, and that can be an important anchor in building out this broader ecosystem. Uh, motivated and um, motivated for the right reasons. I sound like I'm on The Bachelor. Motivated and there for the right reasons. Private sector partners <laughs> who really want, um, you know, to do right by their company, but also uh, to create a relationship with the community that goes beyond just being extractive, I guess is how I would put it. Uh, and then I think you know, the national labs, from my perspective, can be honest brokers in this ecosystem, right? We work in the public service, so I'm not going to make money off this no matter how it goes. My interest really is in understanding, can we solve some of these problems? Can we take some of these technologies to scale? And what is it that we could offer that would accelerate that process or facilitate that process? And so getting all those elements together um, I think is really going to be key, and it has to be a patient process. Right? We, we spent decades creating the system we have now. Uh, the energy sector in particular changes very slowly, and so um, we have to be a little patient with how we make these changes. But that, you know, that sense of community and trusted partners is really at the heart of it. So I think it's a big opportunity for all of us. Thank you, Kim, for an extraordinary and I think, I think inspiring presentation. This is really what we want this series to be about, is, is speakers like Kim who can inspire our community and, and get us thinking big about the future. So I just appreciate it so much. And as a token of our appreciation, uh, we have a small bag of lasers here for you. Yeah.
Yeah, great. And, You're very kind. And uh, please join me in, in, in uh, thanking Kim again for her really extraordinary presentation. Thank you.